Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 to 11. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things, and so they came into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones I look on with favour, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. But whoever sacrifices a bull is like one who kills a person, and whoever offers a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. Whoever makes a grain offering is like one who presents pig's blood, and whoever burns memorial incense is like one who worships an idol. They have chosen their own ways, and they delight in their abominations. So I also will choose harsh treatment for them and will bring on them what they dread. For when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, no one listened. They did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word, your own people who hate you and exclude you because of my name have said, Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. Yet they will be put to shame. Hear that uproar from the city. Hear that noise from the temple. It is the sound of the Lord repaying his enemies all they deserve. Before she goes into labour, she gives birth. Before the pains come upon her, she delivers a son. Who has ever heard of such things? Who has ever seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day, or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labour than she gives birth to her children. Do I bring to the moment of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Do I close up the womb when I bring to delivery, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice greatly with her, all you who mourn over her. For you will feed and be satisfied at her comforting breasts. You will drink deeply and delight in her overflowing abundance. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 12 to 24 For this is what the Lord says, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the wealth of nations like a flooding stream. You will feed and be carried on her arm, and dandled on her knees. As a mother com comforts her child, so will I comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart will rejoice, and you will flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord will be made known to his servants, but his fury will be shown to his foes. See. The Lord is coming with fire, and his chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and with his sword, the Lord will execute judgment on all people, and many will be, will be those slain by the Lord. Those who consecrate and purify themselves to go into the gardens following one who is among those who eat the flesh of pigs, rats, and other unclean things. They will meet their end together with the one they follow, declares the Lord. And I, because of what they have planted, plan, or because of what they have planned and done, am about to come and gather the people of all nations and languages, and they will come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and I will send some of those who survive to the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans and Lydians, famous as archers, to Tubal and Greece, and to the distant islands that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will proclaim my glory among the nations, and they will bring all your people from all the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord, on horses, in chariots, and wagons, and on mules, 
and camels, says the Lord. They will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings to the temple of the Lord in ceremonially clean vessels. And I will select some of them also to be priests and Levites, says the Lord. As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. From one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. And they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched and they will be loathsome to all mankind. Amen. Um, when I started this sermon series, um, I had no idea at all that uh, my last week here would be based on the last chapter of this book, um, because we have looked at every one of the 66 chapters of Isaiah. And this passage is quite a lengthy one. I'm going to be talking a little bit about what Isabel read and a little bit about what Linus read. But I can't really do all of it justice uh, today because of time constraints. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about it. When I start preparing a sermon based on the Old Testament, I start looking at it in Hebrew, which is the language that it was originally written in. And only then do I come to look at it in English. Now in both languages, throughout this particular passage, one word comes up again and again and again. And it came across really well in the way that Linus read it for us because as that phrase says the Lord you know in Hebrew that word is Yahweh and the idea at the center of this is that when all things are made right God is at the heart of it <coughs> now on one level we all want a better world but also we know that if we are to have a better world then evil must be stopped but the idea of God judging those who do evil is always difficult for us you know if we contemplate Adolf Hitler, or Benito Mussolini, or Joseph Stalin, then those people, it's really easy to think that the fact that they're no longer around is a good thing. But other people, less so. And this um, passage talks about um, in the third verse, it says that those who make sacrifices are like those who worship idols. Now, first of all, we have to remember that this is in the heart of the Old Testament, and the sacrifices had largest, largely been instituted by God himself. So why is that wrong? What is wrong is to be someone who does what God requires in our religion, but to live the rest of our lives in a way that does not recognize God. And therefore, if we come to the communion table or in the Old Testament to the temple, 
<coughs> excuse me, with our sacrifice that achieves nothing. It makes no difference to us. And people say, well, we don't worship idols today. And I could come up with some thing where I say, well, we worship money or we worship big business or whatever. But I read something astonishing this week in the news. You know, um, I'm no fan of the way that China is governed. Um, and um, it is one of these situations where sometimes it seems to me that it is communism in name, capitalism in deed, and an horrendous dictatorship in fact. And then today in the news we find out within this last week that the Chinese government go into Christian churches and they take down the crosses and they put up pictures of the nation's leader. And this is kind of sickening. So the true church has been driven underground because like in Hitler's period in Austria, they changed the prayers. So Hitler effectively became part of the Godhead. And so there are very strange things going on in our world. But God has a plan. And his plan involves bringing peace to the earth, but also bringing judgment to the earth. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, said famously, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth because I will separate one from another. And God has said that those who do evil will be judged with fire and those who seek to be makers of peace and lovers of God and those who put their trust in Jesus will be made whole. You know, Jesus again famously said, blessed are the peacemakers. And there's a film out there from when I was a teenager, which is funny in parts. It's more really a series of sketches than anything else. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this or remembers it, uh, The Life of Brian. One of my favorite writers got very hot under collar about, about this film, but that's another story. And um, the one famous scene is where um, two men are sitting listening to a preacher on a hill, whoever that might be, and they can't quite hear what he's saying. And they say, and one of them says to them, what did he say? He said, blessed are the cheese makers. And uh, he said, well, he can't only be saying cheese makers. He must mean other dairy products as well. But a joke's a joke. And I'm not one to take offense, really. But as great as it is, to have cheese in our fridges. What our world needs more and more is peace. And sometimes it gets to the point where you cannot even figure who is right or who is wrong. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. One man's revenge is another man's horrendous blight on somebody else's country. So don't ask me to tell you who is right between Lebanon and Palestine and Israel. 
because I don't know anymore. On the other hand, there are situations that is easy to discern. You know, if somebody said to me, what do you think about Ukraine and Russia, Darren? Well, I think Ukraine are the ones who are in the right, as long as they exercise a little bit of restraint. Now, we don't like the idea of hell. And I guess every one of us, to some degree, gulps in those last verses where it says, and they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eats them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched and they will be loathsome to all mankind. That's verse 24. And it is hard to hear, but unless God does step in, then everything is lost. On one hand we say, well, why doesn't God do something about it? And therefore God must not be there. On the other hand, if we hear of God doing something about it, we say, well, that doesn't seem fair. We can't have it both ways. I could tell you again that Jesus is the first step of God doing something about it. And we kind of like... Um, you know, up in the Sunday school room. It's um, October now. There's a song out there that I like. October. And kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. But you go on. Speaking of God. Written by an Irish songwriter called Bono. And um, it's October, and there's still a nativity scene up in the Sunday school room. Knitted figures of Mary and Joseph and a little uh, manger with baby Jesus. And we love that. And Easter, not so much. We love the fact that Easter has the promise of faith and peace. But an innocent, innocent man dying on a cross, we don't like too much. You know, speaking of music, there's an album of Christmas music that I really love that I've been banging on about for years because it makes a lot of money for charity by a guy called Bob Dylan. And uh, on the back cover of that album, there's a picture of the wise men making their way to the stable or wherever Jesus was born and here in this passage in verse 20 it says and they will bring all your people from all the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord on horses in chariots and wagons and on mules and camels and when I hear camels, I start thinking wise men. Even though I don't really know whether they had camels, they may have come on mules. Although it doesn't seem quite right to be, you know, I'm not even convinced there were three kings, but, or whether they were kings. And I only really know what the Bible tells us. Um, but it is that situation we don't know what happened to those men. But God says that amongst those who come to him, some will receive peace from his hands. And he talks about the way that the message will be carried out to the islands. He talks about Tarshish and the Libyans and Lydians and Tubal and Greece. Um, 
That's verse 19. You know, two ball. There was a program on when I was a child called the Banana Splits. And in that there was, uh, there was a group of uh, kind of superheroes called the Arabian Nights, uh, with a K on the beginning. And uh, one of them was called something like Tubal. So I don't know what country now Tubal is, but I think of the guy in the Arabian Nights. Mostly because I think of the banana splits because they made me laugh. And then, then in verse 22, it says that there will be new heavens and new earth. And this straight away transports me to the book of Revelation. But in truth, the idea of the new heavens and the new earth, God making everything true and everything right, is a golden thread that runs throughout the whole of Scripture. And people say to me, oh Darren, the book of Revelation is so hard to read. I find the Gospel of John much harder to read because when I read the Gospel of John, I have to live by it. With the book of Revelation, I only have to understand it. And the roots of its teaching is found in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all those books of the Bible. And we kind of mystify ourselves with it when it's actually much simpler than we think it is. And it's not all about the end of the world. But God is going to make things good. And if you hate the idea of the fact that there will be a judgment and that that sounds nasty, you are the solution. I am the solution. Get busy now and be a peacemaker. Like I said earlier, we need the cheesemakers. You know, it's, uh, a week ago we were eating in a place called the Red Diner on uh, 44th Street in Manhattan and uh, Isabel had toasted cheese one day. It's good. And, um, you know, um, we need cheesemakers, but we need peacemakers a heck of a lot more. And if we make peacemakers, we make people who will live well before God and turn to the teachings of Jesus and mend their ways. I was raised in a house where nobody ever talked of God. Nobody ever talked of Jesus. And yet I stand here for half an hour every Sunday, commending the teachings of Jesus as well as the things of the church to people. Because if you can't figure out that it is good to love your neighbor as you love yourself and to love your enemy, then in a way, you deserve the planet you get. And I hope that for myself, and I get a heck of a lot of things wrong, I hope I'm a better person now than I was when I was 18. And the thing to me is that when I was 18, I thought I knew everything. I don't know if you've ever known this, but every 18-year-old in the world, Gary, you've got this coming. Every 18-year-old in the world knows everything. And then when you get to 19 and 20 and 21 and 31 and 41 and 51 and so on, you start to realize that your convictions are not all right. And then you have to choose, first of all, to put your life in Jesus' nail-scarred hands. 
and then to look at life in a different way. There's an old hymn out there which I've never actually heard, but I've kind of, I know a little bit of the words. It says, count your blessings, count them one by one. I don't know the tune, I don't know the rest of the words, but it's kind of a different attitude to life. Because if you're going through tough times, it's way better to estimate that you're going through tough times with God than going through them on your own. I think anyway.